seated on his throne. Come, let us adore him. Behold a king, nothing can compare. Come, let us adore him. Father, please. Help us to see where Jesus is now, ruling over everything for us. Lord, please speak to us now as we listen to your word. Help us to hear your amazing voice. Amen. Okay, Ellie is going to come and bring today's reading. Thanks, Ellie. So today's reading is from Psalm 23 and John chapter 10, verses 1 to 5. So, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Very truly, I tell your Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the the sheepfold by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep the gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice he calls out his own sheep by name and leads them out when he has brought out all of his own he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice but they will never follow a stranger In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Thanks, Ellie. Let's ask for God's help before we look at that together. Oh, Father, we just thank you for what we heard last week, how you're such a relentless shepherd, Lord Jesus, how you just somehow come after us when we wander off. You so, you're literally, Lord, you're dying to gather us into your flock, into your arms and carry us home rejoicing to the Father in heaven. Lord, thank you that you're such a good shepherd We just pray this morning, Lord, you would speak to us and help us to see what it is to be one of your sheep. If we don't like the idea of it, Lord, help us to see it's the only way to be, to have life. Lord, for your glory's sake we ask. Amen. Okay, so from the prayer, you've guessed what we're looking at. (laughs) So we're going through a series of... Really, who God is, how he wants to be known, what sort of relationship he wants with us, and then how we need to learn to see ourselves. So we've done father and children. We've done a bit of a different one, gardener and garden. And last week we did shepherd. So you know what's coming now, isn't it? Sheep. Um, Me and my friend Lee... We used to go to a minister's conference every year where there was a a guy who was a minister of a church and a shepherd and a farmer. And one one time we were getting to know him and he just started telling all these stories about these crazy sheep. So every year it became a bit of a tradition then. We'd say, tell us some more stories about the sheep. And his line was this, okay? They invent ways to kill themselves. He said, literally, he said, "I'd, I'd have... You think about health and safety for us, isn't it? With scaffolding, high-vis jackets, helmets, 
Oh, you don't have harnesses, all sorts of stuff. You're not allowed to do anything now, are you, without all that sort of stuff. Insurance. He said, if I'm not around as their shepherd, uh, everything could be sorted out for them. The food's that I don't know, everything's fine. You think they're safe, I'll come back. I think one time he said he found one of them literally hanging through a piece of rope. It was alive, fortunately, he could rescue it. But he said, I, there was no way to climb up there, but somehow the sheep had found a way to climb up in this barn and, oh, what happens if I put my head through this loop of rope? And there it was, dangling. And he said, like, how did you get there? How on earth did you get there? He didn't even know, didn't even understand. So, I think the picture of sheep is a really good one for us, isn't it? Partly because of that, we invent ways of bringing death to ourselves, don't we, through sin, which is like, oh my goodness. And I know some people are like, I don't like being called a sheep, because sheep are like weak and vulnerable and helpless, and it's not a good picture, is it? I'd rather be a lion or, I don't know, a bear or something strong, isn't it? Something that has a bit of wisdom, something that has some strength and ability. I don't like the whole sheep thing. Well, we're going we're gonna to find out, actually, it's an amazing thing to be and you've you got to start if you're a Christian you've got to start seeing yourself as a sheep and actually enjoy being one okay if you can't you've got to stay awake till the end because we're going to find out how you can we're going to go through and look but we saw isn't it last week Jacob leaning on his staff Hebrew says worshipped and what did he say the God who has been my shepherd all the days of my life to this very day. Jacob was an impossible sheep, wasn't he? He literally did invent ways of killing himself, because we, we looked at that last week, isn't it? He wandered off, he manipulated everyone around him, he tried to control his whole life, do his plan, his way, all those sorts of things, and Jesus literally had to come and grab him by the horns, that's in the end, isn't it, if he's like a sheep, isn't it, and wrestle him, physically fight him, to say, not to destroy him, but just say, just hold on to me, that's the way you get life, and it was only at the end of his life he actually took on that name that Jesus wanted to give him all along, someone who's wrestled with God and overcome by losing, so you lose to Jesus, and you win, because then you're clinging on to him. And if you've got a shepherd like that, someone that Jacob, the, the sheep who invented ways to kill himself, if he could look back on his life and say, Jesus has been my God, my shepherd, all the days of my life to this very day. If he's like the worst example almost, then if you have a shepherd like that, who wouldn't want to be a sheep of his? If he comes out looking for us when we get scattered, if he heals us when we're wounded, if he feeds us, all those things, it's actually an amazing thing to be a sheep. And for all their sheep's weaknesses, vulnerabilities, just not seeing very well, there is one thing that sheep are very good at. And it's this. They have discerning ears. They can pick out the voice of their shepherd amongst all the other voices they hear. That's him or her. That's the voice of my shepherd. And they are amazing. Apparently they don't hear much else very well. They don't see very well. They're quite weak, aren't they? They're very vulnerable. They get attacked very easily. But that is the one thing they do well. They know their shepherd's Voice and they run to him. And that's the thing in John 10 that Jesus picks out, isn't it? My sheep know my voice. You don't ever thought about it like this. It's really your ears that make you a Christian. That's how Jesus is describing it in John 10. The fact that you know Jesus, you might not have audibly heard Jesus' voice, but the fact you know, you, you hear when he's speaking to you through the Bible, through other Christians, through circumstances, whatever it might be. Among all the other voices, you hear every week in the media, your own heart, your own imagination, your own worries, the voice of the devil accusing you and tempting you. 
loads of other voices putting you down, telling you you're guilty, you're rubbish, you need to do this, you need to follow this, you need to eat this, you need to drink all this in, you need to live for this. All those other voices. There is one voice. The voice of Jesus. And he comes and he calls you by your name. He knows you. Remember after Jesus had died, and there's Mary in the garden, isn't it? She thinks he's the gardener. What is it that tells her that it's Jesus? He calls her name, isn't it? Mary. Not once, but twice. Mary. That moment she knows the same. It's almost like he's different somehow. He, she doesn't recognise him. As soon as he speaks, there's his voice. There's the discerning ears. That's Jesus. Only he speaks my name that way. Only he knows me the way God knows me. And if you're a Christian here today, Jesus has come and he's called you by your name. Follow me. Psalm 49 Verse 14 says this, This is the fate of those who trust in themselves, listen to their own voice, their own heart, their own imagination, or others, and of their followers who approve their sayings. They are like sheep and are destined to die. Death will be their shepherd. What a terrifying thought, isn't it? If we listen to our own thoughts, our own feelings, our own imaginations and other people and follow other people's sayings, whatever this world teaches, the shepherd we have chosen for ourselves is death. Can you remember before the time you trusted in Jesus, before you are a Christian, or maybe you're still there now, maybe you're not quite a Christian, maybe you've never heard anything about Jesus before, and you watch all the different parts of your life start to die, isn't it? I try and make myself feel something. There's just nothing there. Just death, just coldness, just numbness. It's like sin is there. You're following that shepherd. Death, that's a terrifying thought. But amongst all of that, Jesus has come and he's called your name. He's called you out from being part of that flock, part of death's flock, into his own flock of sheep. He's called you by name. Come and have life. Come and let me restore your soul. And now Jesus calls you one of his sheep. So, you might not be called a group of lions or strong animals and you want that, but sheep. Not something strong, but what makes it amazing is this. He calls us by our names, we hear his voice, he leads us out to the place we can find life and he always stays with us and we're safe. Safe forever. That's what makes it amazing to be one of Jesus' sheep. It doesn't depend on our strength or our ability, but on the shepherd. That's the reassuring thought here, isn't it? Jesus, who are you going to choose to change the world? Tiny little white sheep. <laughs> you might think he's crazy. Why are you going to choose them? Just you wait. You'll see how it's done. We're coming to that at the end. But Micah, the, one of the prophets in the Bible, chapter 5, he's thinking with the help of the Holy Spirit about Jesus coming. And this is how he describes Jesus coming. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely, for then in his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be their peace. Let me say it again, with a shepherd like that, who wouldn't want to be one of his sheep, isn't it? So Micah's looking forward to when Jesus comes, he's like, he is going to stand in the strength and majesty of all the fullness of God, his greatness is going to reach to the ends of the earth so that anyone who trusts in him, they can be at peace 
They can know peace in their hearts, peace in their souls, peace with other Christians, peace with God, because he will stand and shepherd them forever. They'll be secure. What a shepherd. And it depends on him as our shepherd. So we're going to turn to Spurgeon, who was a Victorian preacher. He talks about Psalm 23 and he says this. So really, knowing our shepherd is like that. He says, these are the duties of a sheep. Have you ever heard a sermon like that before? (laughs) The duties of a sheep. As one of God's sheep, as one of Jesus' sheep. What do we need to do then? Okay, so Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. If you're a Christian, the first duty of a sheep is this. Trust your shepherd. Trust your shepherd. In John 10, Jesus says, anyone who's promised stuff before I've come is like a thief and a robber. The devil comes. That's why he comes, isn't it? He comes promising life, but he comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And if you follow what he says, you've experienced that and you've found that out, isn't it? Because he leaves you on your own and he comes and kicks you when you've sinned and says you're hopeless. Or that he's come to steal, kill and destroy. But this is what Jesus says. I have come so that they may have life and have it in all its fullness. That's an amazing thought, isn't it? Jesus says, that's why I've come. That's what I've come to do for my sheep. To give them life. To give you life. And life, not just a little bit, but in all its fullness. Life to the full. You can trust him. And as a sheep, that's your first duty, Spurgeon says. You have to learn to trust him. That's his motivation. Everything he does as your shepherd is to give you life and give you life to the full. Look at it and look at the confidence. Psalm 23, I hadn't quite seen it, but it's written from the perspective of a sheep, isn't it? This is a sheep. If sheep could write, this is what they write. The Lord is my shepherd. He's confident. I shall not be in want. That sounds like someone who's trusting, doesn't it? He makes me lie down in green pastures. I know he leads me to good places. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes. He literally gives me my life back again. He restores my soul. Trust him. Trust that Jesus has everything you need. Trust that Jesus is leading you to places that, where you can feed, where you can rest, where you can be revived. And even if you feel half dead as a Christian, where he can give you your life back again. Praise God he can do that, isn't it? You feel on your last legs as a Christian, this close to giving up. Jesus can give you your life back again. That's the power he has. Trust him. Don't trust yourself. What happens when you trust me, trust yourself? You start to worry, don't you? Yeah, but what about tomorrow? What about next week? What about next year? What about dying? What about when I get old? What about all those worries come flooding in, isn't it? Do you remember the story of the Spartans led by King Leonidas? There was only 300 of them. And they were up against an army of millions Where did they choose to fight? In a tiny little gap, so that only one or two enemies could take them on at one time. Might be millions out there, but they were in a narrow place. So they didn't have to worry about all the other millions of things all at once. Just one, let's fight this one. Then when the next one comes, let's fight the next one. Then when the next one comes, let's fight the next one. Jesus has given you a really narrow place to stand. Do you know what it's called? Today. It's called today. Because Jesus says each day has enough worries of its own. And he teaches us to live one day at a time. If you go out into the wider place of tomorrow, next year, getting old, not enough money, dying, all those sorts of things... You're going to get overwhelmed because people can come at you from all angles. Not saying you've got less enemies, 
because you stand in today. But stand in today. Don't worry about tomorrow, Jesus says. That has enough worries of its own. Just trust him. Does he have what you need today? That one thing that's coming at you today, or a couple of things, one at a time, Jesus says. One step at a time. Trust me. You won't be in want. We need to learn to trust our shepherd, isn't it? How often have we not trusted him and worried and then he's just put things into place and we've got that awkward moment as a Christian, isn't it? I'm sorry, Lord. I should have trusted you. He knows what he's doing. He shepherded billions of sheep through history, just like you. You can trust him. Stand in that narrow place he's given you to stand called today and look to him. Remember when Jesus teaches us to pray, give us today what? All the food we need for our whole lifetime. No, he says in that our daily bread. Give me what I need now, Lord, today, please. Trust him. Second duty of a sheep is to follow your shepherd. Follow Jesus. Trust Jesus because he knows what he's doing. Follow Jesus. Second half of verse three says this. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. How often are we like, I don't know which way to go. I don't know what decision to make. I don't know what to do. I'm not quite sure where to go. I don't know what to think about, I don't know, relationships, money, the future, whatever it might be. Jesus always leads the right way. Don't go your own way. Follow your shepherd, Jesus. I was up on Marine Drive years ago, and this came back to my mind this week. I was praying, looking out to sea, praying. It was really peaceful, like the sun was setting. And then the time was interrupted because this dog came along, started sniffing my back. I didn't, hadn't seen it till I what's that? And it was sniffing around and it found, in that there's really thick bushes on the top of Marine Drive, it found like this silver foil takeaway uh, packet, whatever. And it wasn't completely empty. It still had like all the burnt on dregs there. And it dragged it out of the bush and it started licking this takeaway trail. Like it had never tasted anything so good. I don't know what its owners gave it to eat. It was like this. I'm I'm trying to pray, do you mind? And it's chewing away so noisily. And anyway, the owner comes up, so, oh, sorry about that. Come on, whatever the dog's name was. And the dog looks up, trots alongside its owner. And then do you know what it did? It was following its owner and then it remembered the takeaway. And it turned around and it came back to, it was right by my feet, this box it had left there, started licking the takeaway box again. The owner was slightly further away by now. Whatever the dog's name was, go on! Dog looks up, it's like, follows it, him or her. I thought, oh, there we are. It came back. Wanted more of the takeaway. Now the owner now, is a bit of a hill, the owner's now out of sight. So has to whistle and shout louder. Now the owner's getting a bit, come on! <laughs> it's time to go, we're walking, come on! The dog looks up, can hear the voice, but doesn't follow this time. Because this thing's better than following their owner, so they think. In the end, you could just hear this very faint, no flinch. I was like, oh, what's going to happen? I'm like left with this dog, just eating this curry or whatever it is. In the end, the owner storms back like this, grabs it by its collar and says, come on! We're going, we're going. Can you see the point? How reluctant we are to follow Jesus when he calls us sometimes, isn't it? Because we think what we've got is better. Is it really? That dog's going to have fresh water, fresh food, loads of cuddles, loads of love, brushing at home walks, all with the owner, isn't it? It's some crusty old takeaway because it's all salty and fatty. He thinks it tastes better, isn't it, for a little while. That's what a picture of us with Jesus, isn't it? Jesus is saying, this way? No, that's not the right way for me. 
we're chewing some old mouldy thing that this world has to offer and he's like come on we might follow him then we but we get sidetracked don't we? we get attracted by other things that seem better seem more pleasurable and we we don't follow him like we should but that is our duty isn't it as Spurgeon puts it the second duty of a sheep follow your shepherd where is Jesus leading you He tells us, in paths of righteousness. Don't get muddled up with that long word. It just means he always takes you the right way. Always. Maybe some of you are looking at the path that Jesus has mapped out for you this week and you're like, is that the right way? That doesn't feel like the right way. It doesn't look like the right way. Have you ever stopped to ask directions from someone who's a local in the countryside and they're like, Yeah, take the second left, third right, fourth dip over the hill, up the other side, round by the lake, and and it's just like... And then you look at the first turning, and it's like a lane like that wide, so you've got to try and get your car down, you're like, I don't think that's the right way. It is, they know it is, because they know the area, isn't it? But you're like, I don't think so. It's like that with Jesus, isn't it? Sometimes the path looks wrong to me. Sometimes the path feels wrong to me. Sometimes... It hurts. Sometimes it's stony. Sometimes it looks rocky. Sometimes it looks dangerous. But what does it say here in the Bible? It is always the right way, the right path. Follow him. But notice that you're not walking on your own, is it? What were the directions again? He is with you. Follow him. He's leading. Just have to follow in his footsteps. It's always the right path. For his name, literally, he stakes his name on it. He says, this is the right path for you, on my name. I'm going to show you. Follow Jesus, even if you don't understand. Even if it looks rocky. Even if it feels and looks wrong. He is leading you in paths of righteousness, the right way. Because he loves you, he cares for you. Next one is this, have confidence in your shepherd. Trust your shepherd, follow your shepherd, have confidence in your shepherd. Verse 4 says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Have confidence in your shepherd. That's not written like nervously, is it? Like, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm going to be absolutely terrified of almost everything and uh, nothing can bring me comfort. No, this is confidence, isn't it? When I was a, a teenager, we moved house and it was a new area. So we lived, we were like a semi detached house like that. And then there was a little path. And then there was just this straight track like that. On the left was one field and then a a junior school. On the right was two empty fields. There was no lamppost, no lighting. And our church was at the end of the track and down the road a little bit. It was fine in the day. We used to play in the fields, play football, mess about, all sorts of stuff. But a totally different story when it got dark. No lights. First time I tried to get to church youth club, I was like walking down this track. And you know what happens, isn't it, in the dark? You hear a little noise and you start to get a bit worried. And then your imagination starts going and you start to play all sorts of scenarios through your head, don't you? And you you freak out, freak yourself out. Do you know what I did? I lasted about 10 seconds and I just sprinted as fast as I could along this track. I don't even know if I breathed. I was just like, get to the end. I was running. It was terrifying. One time I was coming. So that's what I used to do. I couldn't walk. It was too terrifying. I'm just going to have to sprint. Just get through it as quick as I can. Charge. Almost like hold my breath. I got quite good in the end at just sprinting because that's what I used to do all the time. One time I heard, I started sprinting and I heard on the other side of the hedge this thundering running alongside me and I realised it's a big dog I got hold of my scent 
And he, we were literally going parallel along the hedge, and I was totally freaking out. I would run faster, he would run faster. I'd be like, oh no, sprint! And I, I was literally going at top speed, as fast as I could. Just, I couldn't shut my eyes, obviously, because it's dark. I was always worried as well, what if someone just steps out in front of me? We're just going to have a massive collision. But this dog, though, I knew there was a gap coming up in the hedge, and he, he could just get me then. Nothing was holding him back. Just as we got there, I could hear the, <laughs> the panting through this. You wonder why I'm a bit nervous of dogs. Lots of stories. Just as we got to the gap, the owner called him off. And I, I heard him turn around and go back to the owner. I was just, what a relief. I had no confidence in myself. I had to just run as fast as I could. Do you know, it was a different story if my dad was with me. If my dad was with me, we weren't sprinting, partly because he was a bit older, but mostly because I had confidence in him. In the dark, we walked. We didn't run. And we walked calmly and confidently. And even though I might have been like this, is this still going to be all right? I just had to look at how calm and confident he was. Every time with that incident, safely got there. Not running, not being terrified, calmly, step by step. Have confidence in Jesus, your shepherd. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. Jesus walks right beside you with his rod and his staff. All authority in heaven and earth are his. Even the darkest place is not dark to Jesus. He just has to turn up. You notice that at the start of the Bible. All the world is dark, isn't it? Everything is dark until the word of God, until Jesus turns up. And then the darkness just has to vanish because Jesus is the light of the world. And as he speaks, just light bursts out from him everywhere. There's no darkness anymore. He just has to turn up. Isn't that amazing? And he says, I will walk with you wherever you go. So if you're walking through illness, trials, pain, suffering, even death, you can walk calmly and even confidently because Jesus has power over them all and he is walking with you. Isn't that amazing? Have confidence in him. He's walked that way through the darkest valley with millions of Christians before you. He knows how to walk. Next one, eat what your shepherd gives you. So he says, verse five, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. We've all seen videos and we have sheep in a field when the shepherd shakes the bucket of food. They all come running over, don't they? Because they know he's got something good. Come running over. Let's have a bit of that. Let's eat. Eat what Jesus gives you. Isn't it an amazing thought? He says here, it's very specific, isn't it? You prepare a table, a meal before me in the presence of all my enemies. So you can be surrounded by all sorts of enemies on every side, bullies and people who hate you and all sorts of things, physical enemies, spiritual enemies, all these different things surrounding you. And right in the middle, Jesus saying, I, I've got food for you even here. I've got what you need even now. He's shaking. What's he got? He's got his word. He feeds us with his word. And that's the best thing, isn't it? How nourishing, how satisfying are Jesus' words that he speaks to us. You've been surrounded, you've been doubting, you've been worried, and you've heard this. Anyone who confesses their sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive them their sins. Couldn't you just feed on that forever? I've 
sinned this week and Jesus comes and he's like, there's forgiveness. Feed on it. Let it nourish you. I forgive it. If you're a Christian here today, you are forgiven for all your sins, all of your past. Jesus has died and he's wiped it all away. The one we heard earlier, isn't it? Nothing can snatch us out of his hand. And we're like, but it's all trying, it's all pulling me. I feel pulled a million different ways in my life. But Jesus says, my hold on you is stronger than anything else. Nothing can snatch you out of my hand. Couldn't you chew on that and digest that and, and let that nourish you for ages? What does Jesus give us to eat? Clean food. Sheep are clean animals in the Bible. They don't eat other animals. They don't tear. Can you imagine a sheep with massive long claws and fangs? Ever seen one of them? No, that's why they're clean sheep. They don't tear at other animals. They don't get involved with killing and death. They definitely don't eat other sheep. They eat grass, clean food. Jesus gives us food that makes us clean. When he holds out his hand and says, this is what you need to take, this is what you need to chew on, this is what you need to digest, this is what you need to satisfy you, eat it. Eat it all in. Drink it all in. Eat what he gives. Don't have to taste what this world tastes. Jesus is satisfying. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. If you're not a Christian today, you're like, you can have a taste of Jesus' love. He's died for you, he's risen again, and the Bible says it's good. In fact, it's more than good, it's the best thing you've ever known when you trust him. Now if we see Jesus is that relentless shepherd, trust your shepherd, follow your shepherd, have confidence in your shepherd, eat what your shepherd gives, that leads to this one. Verse 6, surely, surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When you see what Jesus has arranged as your shepherd, when you see how satisfying he is, how much confidence he can bring, how much food he gives you, how he leads you through the darkest places, how his voice can be trusted, what does that lead to? Enjoy your shepherd. Enjoy him. Love him. That's the language of love there, isn't it? He's like, surely, he's convinced. Look at what, everything he's seen. Surely, the only things that are going to be following me are his goodness and his love all the days of my life. He's going to be chasing me up with love, chasing me up with goodness. And if that wasn't enough, I have an incredible future in the new heavens and new earth where I will live in Jesus' home forever. No more crying, no more death, no more pain, no more suffering. No more frustration, no more depression, no more cancer, nothing. Everything wrong, everything dark is going to be expelled because Jesus is going to fill it with light and love. That's where I'm going to live forever. What confidence. His goodness and love are going to chase me up and ahead of me is all that. I can enjoy my shepherd. I can enjoy Jesus with absolute security. Is that how you've ever viewed being a Christian? That's why it's amazing to be a sheep, isn't it? Because of the amazing shepherd. Now, very quickly, there are two big don'ts as a sheep. Do trust your shepherd. Do follow your shepherd. Do have confidence in your shepherd. Do eat what your shepherd gives. Do love and enjoy your shepherd, Jesus. But these two, they're in Ezekiel 34, this one. First of all, do not trample or muddy food and water for others. What do I mean? Well, you can read it in Ezekiel 34. Jesus talks to some of the sheep and he says, look, you come along and you eat what you want and if that isn't enough, you trample all the rest of it so no one else has got anything. You drink in all the, the help from my spirit that I give you in church every Sunday and then what do you do? You sort of with your hooves, you stir up the water so all the other sheep come along and they're like, oh, it's all muddy now. Can you see what Jesus is saying? As a sheep, you live in a flock, recognize others. He gives you what you need here. Don't spoil it for others. If you're with a new Christian, 
And they are literally drinking in everything Jesus is saying. That's to be enjoyed. One way we muddy the waters might be to criticise the sermon to them, isn't it? Yeah, but he didn't really know what he was talking about. Oh, my view is this, that's not, that's not really right. What is it? It muddies the waters, doesn't it? It makes things unclear. And they were just literally like, oh, Jesus is speaking to me and drinking it in. Or feeding on what Jesus has done and make it really complicated, sort of trampling it down. What you need to know is this doctrine and that doctrine, all these different things. That will come. Jesus will teach it. But we need to be careful, isn't it? Like, remember, I think a good example is Boaz in the Bible, isn't it? He leaves all that grain for Ruth to pick up, doesn't he? Because it's all mine. You're not having any. But he leaves it there, and anyone can come and take and eat and enjoy, and then they're brought in. So don't trample, don't muddy the waters by being selfish. The second one is this. Don't butt other sheep. It's very clear, don't butt other sheep. So some sheep were bigger and they were coming in and butting others out of the way, shoulder charging them like you see in football or something, isn't it? Uh, again, me and my friend Lee, we were on a study leave a couple of years ago and we went out on this walk in the country, we were praying and stuff like that, and all of a sudden we heard this noise, I can't even describe it, it's just like a, a big hollow thud. And our stomachs like moved. Have you ever been like in a concert where they got those big bass subwoofers and you're like, like that really low gutsy sound, isn't it? You don't expect that in the country. We just heard this massive smash and our stomachs were like, what is that? Smash. And we looked up and there was two sheep or rams butting each other. It was so loud. It's like the sound went through buildings, through our stomachs. It shook us up. It was so powerful, so loud. When we butt each other as sheep, as church members, the sound goes through the rest of the flock. And that's a bad thing. Very bad thing. And that's why Jesus picks up on it. Why do we shove each other out the way? Because we're worried for ourselves. We, f- we think we're better than others, we get full of pride, we think we're stronger, we've been here longer, we're entitled to more. What do we do when we butt them and shoulder charge them? We drive them away. And that's not what we want, is it? There is space here for everyone. I mean, literally, look, first, isn't it? There's lots more space yet. Jesus makes room for every sheep. There's no need to shove. Jesus has enough for you. And remember, you might have been a sheep longer than some others, but you're still a sheep. Don't become full of pride and think you're above or something else, because we'll start doing all this sort of stuff. And when a church starts to do that, people start to go. Don't butt other sheep. Now, very quickly to finish, okay? But in one way, this is the most amazing thing. You might have been sat there so far thinking, I don't like any of this. I don't like being called a sheep. I don't like being compared to a sheep. Surely there has to be some other way. It doesn't seem like wisdom to me for the people that God is going to show off his wisdom through to be just a group of sheep. How are they going to change the world? How are we going to change the world? How are we going to have any effect just standing in a field going, nah, all day? How's that going to do anything? That doesn't, and we just what, follow him and we just trust him. And it doesn't sound, surely we have to have like strategies and tactics. How on earth are we going to take on these wolves that come into church sometimes or that come into our lives and we can try and tear us apart? How are we going to take on all our enemies? How are we going to take on death? Well, remember, just for a moment, look up and see Jesus. There he is as our shepherd. That's how we've been looking at him. But have another look. Look up again. Because what you'll see is how he does it is this. The shepherd becomes one of the sheep. If you think it's wrong, 
Jesus, the shepherd, becomes one of us. Isn't that incredible? That's what we're remembering Christmas time, isn't it? The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory. The one who's come from the Father, full of grace and truth. This shepherd, you're like, oh yeah, look at him with his staff and his rod. And look at him, he's powerful, isn't he? This beard and he goes around and he fights lions and bears and wolves. Yeah, but how does he do it? He becomes a sheep. But there's more. Look again. Because as he's become a sheep, the longer you look, he starts to shrink into the smallest, weakest, most helpless sheep of all, a little lamb. How is Jesus going to take on the sin of the world as a lion, as a bear, as a wolf, whatever big... No. What did John the Baptist say when he saw him? Behold the... Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He does it as a lamb. Isn't that awesome? How's he going to take on the sin of the world? He's going to go into the sheep dip. That's where John the Baptist is baptizing, isn't it? Where other sheep are trying to be washed. And what's he going to do? He's going to go in as a little lamb and he's going to swim in. And how is he going to deal with the sin of the world? As he goes into the sheep dip, all the sin, all the filth, all the muck is going to be absorbed into his little fleece. And he's going to take it all so all the other sheep can be clean. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He does it as a lamb. How does Jesus take on all his enemies and all the religious leaders and the Pharisees who are trying to tear him apart like wolves all the time? He says, I'm sending you out as lambs among wolves. Jesus dealt with them as a lamb how does Jesus how is he going to go on trial and face all the false accusations of the world that he's drunk and that he's not really a king and that he's evil and he's demon possessed all the things that are thrown at him that are not true Isaiah says like a sheep before the shearers is silent he defeats them all as a lamb yeah, but how is he going to take on death? How is he going to walk through the valley of the shadow of death? How is he going to take on this huge dragon, the devil, who has the power of death? How is he going to do that? Isaiah says this, led like a lamb to the slaughter. Jesus takes on a dragon as a lamb wins. Does it as a lamb. But how is he going to buy me back from sin? How is he going to pay for my whole life? How is he going to redeem me? How is he going to turn away God's anger? The Bible says, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. He does it as a lamb. Yeah, but how is he going to reign in the highest place? Because he's, he's like in the control centre of the universe. Okay, he's defeated death. He's risen back up to heaven. And now he rules over everything. Surely he's like some huge, awesome, like angel, like times a million, like indestructible, glorious. And now just this light is coming out of him. What do all the people in heaven say in Revelation when they see him? What does John say when he looks at the throne? There before me, I saw a throne, and on it was seated a lamb. And then all of heaven burst out singing, Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive glory and honour. You think there's some other way? The only way is being one of his sheep. The only way is being one of his lambs. That's how he does it all. Isn't that incredible? And if he can take on death and sin and, and turn away God's anger and, all our, and pay for all of us, all of our lives and fix us and rule over the whole universe as a lamb, think about what he can do as a lion and all the other things. Only God could create a way to do that. So, very last question for you. How are you going to conquer then? 
How are you going to live? Revelation gives you the answer. They overcame him, that's the devil and all his powers, by the blood of the Lamb. That's how. That's real power. Being a sheep, being one of Jesus' sheep, is the most incredible thing as you could ever know. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb. Did you know anti-venom, loads of anti-venoms are made from lamb's blood, sheep's blood, because it's resistant to serpent's attacks. There he is, the lamb, resistant to all the devil's attacks, and it's his blood that covers us. It's his blood that washes us clean. You need to be his sheep, there's no other way. Being a sheep, yes, weak, vulnerable, helpless, but look how he does it. Worthy is the lamb. Our shepherd. Don't even ask me how that works, but he's both. And someone who got it, and we'll finish with this, says, it's an old hymn. The king of love, my shepherd is, whose goodness faileth never. I nothing lack if I am his, and he is mine forever. Lord Jesus, please help us to be good sheep, to trust you, to follow you, to have confidence in you, to enjoy everything you have. Thank you, Jesus, as a lamb, you overcame everything. Help us to see that's the way, your way, that's the right way. For your glory's sake we ask. Amen. We're going to stand and we're going to sing. We sung it last week and it just fits in so well with what we've done. We're going to sing again, The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. Maybe you can sing it through new eyes as a sheep now, with new confidence, seeing how amazing Jesus is. my shepherd I'll not want he makes me lie in pastures green he leads me by the still still waters his goodness restores my soul and I will trust in you trust in you alone. For your endless mercy follows me. Your goodness will lead me home. He guides my ways in righteousness. And he
the comfort I need to know and I will trust in you alone and I will trust in you end of a Bible verse at the end uh, just to seal God's word in our hearts. So as a church we'd just like to raise our hands, there's nothing weird, it's just when our hands are raised we're just saying my heart is open to, to God's word spoken to us. Let me just read that verse from Revelations, it says this, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and praise. God bless you and amen. Amen. We've got teas and coffees downstairs afterwards. Everyone is welcome to